Morning. I was about to say, if you have brought your Bibles with you, but of course, you will have brought your Bibles with you. So, if you, when you've got your Bibles opened on your lap, turn them to 2 Timothy and chapter 3. It's just great to read for ourselves rather than on the screen. I'm sure it's there on the screen behind me. I have every faith that's there. And we're just going to read a handful of verses from verse 10 of Paul's second letter, letter to Timothy in chapter 3. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's the good news for Sunday morning. <laughs> While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We live in an age where I guess it's probably reasonably true to say that reading is actually becoming a lost art. It's not something that is commonly practiced anymore because we live in a media world where everything seems to be about fast-moving pictures, graphics and sound bites and all kinds of sound effects and amazing screen pictures in front of us. And we can listen to our Bibles on CD. We can view them in picture and in movement on DVD, we can download multicolored audio visual from the internet, and all of these have tremendous value. But I just have a very sneaky feeling that God gave us written, printed scriptures for a reason, and they have survived centuries. My mom was an avid reader, and she introduced my brother Phil and I to the local town library at a very young age. Mum, despite her many duties, as a mum, as a pastor's wife, as a school teacher, managed to get through probably at least two books every single week and encouraged Phil and I to do the same. Dad was a pastor, a leader of a church, and is it primary interest was in the Bible and in the church and in all things Christian. And so he would raid bookstalls and second-hand shops wherever he travelled in order to add to his vast collection of theological books. Reading was something that was important to him too. And like Dad, I've got a considerable number of different Bibles bearing different translations generational vocabulary, each grants me an additional insight into the message of the scriptures through the wonderful use of language. So that's the first question this morning. Do you have a Bible? Because you need one. You absolutely need one. If you do not have a Bible, get one. And if that is a financial challenge, mention it because we want you to have one and we'll help you to get one. Last time out, just a few weeks ago, probably seems like yesterday, we looked at three practical ways in which to aid ourselves to love God's word by daily reading it and practically obeying it. Do you remember what we talked about? We talked about the importance of getting comfortable and concentrating. We talked about asking vital questions 
as we read, in order to get important answers. And we look to, spoke about chatting with the author as we read. Well, today I want to look at three more ways to learn to love your Bible. I wonder if you started to engage in some of those principles already. Number one, make it a part of your daily spiritual diet. Make it a part of your daily spiritual diet. We seem to live in a generation where there is probably a specific diet for every day of the week. No, probably every day of the month. Maybe every day of the year. There are so many potential diets, physical diets, that we could engage in. There are diets to lose weight. There are diets to gain energy. There are diets to boost mental health. There are diets to aid physical fitness amongst many others. Amongst, in the midst of all of that, what we gain and what we understand at the very least is this, that what we eat and how we eat does tend to be important. It matters. It makes a difference. Now, if you're like me, most of us are governed by what tastes nice. That kind of what attracts me above everything else. And what brings us personal satisfaction. The stuff on the plate that actually stops me feeling hungry is pretty important to me. What we enjoy. And so probably most of us don't actually delve into the science of it all that much. But we know that what's on the plate tends to do us good and tends to keep us alive from day after day with a bit of pleasure in between. It's as we become especially concerned for our physical health, perhaps, and our mental health and physical fitness, that we begin to focus a bit more upon the kinds of foods that we eat and what they actually do and the part that they play in achieving those ultimate health aims. But one thing's for sure. Not a single one of us is going to grow effectively, successfully, or healthily in our Christian lives unless we include a regular diet of God's word in our daily routine. It's vital. It's important. Now, I'm guessing, but I think it's a reasonable, calculated, what do they say in the quiz programs, it's an educated guess that probably not a single one of us would be keen to neglect natural food for all that long. There can be an immense pleasure in eating. And our lives are ultimately dependent upon the fact that we do exactly that and take food in, at least from time to time, if we want to stay alive and breathing and healthy and moving and growing. An intake of food is particularly important. And of course, the opposite is true. If we deny ourselves for food from food for long enough, we will eventually get to the point where our life ebbs from us and we are no more in the physical sense. It will literally be the death of us. So we similarly then should not ignore or neglect the importance of our spiritual diet and the key role that our Bibles, that the scriptures play in all of that. That's why you need one. Psalmist put it this way in the longest chapter in the whole of the Bible, which is found in the Psalm 119. And in verse 103, that gives you some idea of how long it is. And that's just over halfway. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Now those are the words of a man who can't get enough of God's word. Those are the words of a man that had got into listening to what God had to say to him and had a passion for finding out what it was that God wants to say today. God, what have you for me to feast upon today? What is it that you want me to learn? He wanted a taste whenever he could. He loved it. And if we really want to hear from God, then Bible reading must become a vital part of our daily lives. That's not something that we have a splash at, now and again. It's not something that we can take or leave, but it needs to be something that actually becomes a driving passion. We should no sooner ignore our Bibles, even for one day, than we would willingly miss a physical meal upon our plate. It really is that important. When I was in my early 20s, and uh, my first child, Ruth, was probably about 
two years old, I spent 10 days in hospital having stomach surgery. And that was an incredibly unpleasant experience, not least for when I woke up, I realized I had some inkling of what was going to happen when I found myself attached to all these tubes and everything. And they were my food purpose for the next seven days. I could nothing went in my, or out of my mouth, or I couldn't drink anything, I couldn't eat anything until the wounds in my stomach began to heal. And that was a pretty torrid, unpleasant time. And it has the same spiritual effect upon our Christian lives when we are denied the nutrients that we need from God's word. So just as we plan our daily meals, what we're going to eat, when we're going to eat it, where we're going to eat it. So we need to take careful plan as to how and when and where we are going to read our Bibles. If we expect God to speak to us, then we need to grant him maximum opportunity to do that. Now, I understand that God can do anything everywhere at any time, and he can muscle in upon any situation, but he has a select way that he seeks to minister to each one of those. And one of them, not all of them, but one of them particularly, is to speak to us through his written word, through the scriptures. And if we cut ourselves off from that means by ignoring our Bibles, by allowing them to gather dust by using them to prop up the broken chair leg rather than to get out and to actually read them, we rob him of one particular means by which he might have chosen to speak to you or to me today. And I just know that if I want to hear from God, I want to keep all the channels open because everything he has to say is vitally important. Few of us would approach the breakfast or the lunch or the tea or supper on our plate is just, oh, I suppose it's something I've got to do. You know, there it is. It's mealtime. I suppose I'll have to wade through it. It's something there that's, I mean, you know, it does smell pretty good. And it does look like it might taste okay. But it's just something that we have to do to stay alive. Very few of us approach our dinner plate in that fashion. But we approach it with some considerable interest, desire, and anticipation. It's not a duty. It's not just a responsibility. I better get dashed down me or the wife will complain. It's something that we actually enjoy doing. Something not just has to be done, but something that we look forward to. Something that we anticipate. Food on our plate, the energy, and the nutrients that it might bring us. If only we could approach our Bible reading in the same way, with the same fervor, with the same energy, with the same enthusiasm. That's what the prophet Jeremiah did in chapter 15 and verse 16. He said, when your words came, I ate them. They were my joy. And my heart's delight. So he speaks of God's word as a source of personal joy and pleasure. I wonder if that's your approach, if that's my approach. Do we understand? I am often blown away by the whole notion that God, the creator of heaven and earth, he who just speaks, he who just thunders, he who sends lightning, he who sends all the great seasons, he who made this magnificent world in which we live, would give me the time of day and even share a passing word with me. It's just remarkable. It's mind-blowing. It's astonishing. And yet he wants to give you attention and me attention each day. So let's be ready and available for when he speaks to us. What a privilege that is. My first girlfriend lived in Manchester. So somebody has to. Um, and she did. And I was living in Kent at the time. And we met, we met at a Christian holiday camp. And it was a very short romance, actually. But... Um, I used to look forward to the post dropping on the mat each morning and the occasional letter with a Manchester postmark on it. Nothing else really mattered, you know. Well, I didn't get any other post anyway. Here's the truth of the matter. But when that letter arrived with the Manchester postmark on it, that was special. Couldn't wait to tear it open, see what she had to say, all those 
couple of months where that romance lasted. It's common to follow seasonal and special diets. Like at Christmas, we have this special diet which wonderfully involves things like turkeys and mince pies and Christmas puddings and Christmas cakes. And then as we are approaching Easter, we're approaching fish on Fridays and hot cross buns and chocolate eggs and diet begins to become a bit more important. And so as we approach, as as we have already done this morning, we have had a, a seasonal approach to our spiritual diet and we've had a quick peek at what happened on Palm Sunday and maybe we'll do that again in just a moment and so we get the taste of the week. So let Bible reading become one of your good daily habits. And secondly, and this really is a passion of mine, encourage your imagination to run riot as you read. Encourage your imagination to run riot as you read. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. See, the medium of print communication lends itself to the use of our imagination like no other medium does. In fact, very few other mediums we need imagination at all. It's already done and set out for us. But nothing compares to the printed page. There's something very different, very unique about book reading or magazine reading or whatever that no other medium brings and maybe that's one of the reasons why God has preserved his very special book of books in print across all of these centuries. Just about every other medium, perhaps the actor, the narrator, the director, interprets the scene for us. We don't have a say in it. It's just presented as a fait accompli. There it is. This is how it is. This is how it happens. This is what it looks like. But when we read, we are left to imagine the scene for ourselves. And we can all read the same page and we'll all be seeing slightly different picture. That's the wonder, the power of imagination. We are left to picture in our minds what the key character looks like. The book will try and paint some kind of description, but it won't give us a picture, it won't give us a photograph, it won't give us a painted image. We conjure that up in our thoughts and in our minds. And we're left to form the images of the events and the action with our own thoughts. And the beauty is that we will probably all perceive the same scenarios with all its details very differently. I don't know if you're like me, but so often sometimes I'll pick up a book and I'll read a book and then a bit later I will see that they've actually made a film out of it and it's on the TV. And more often than not, it's, it's a big source of deflation to me as this key character comes on the screen and it's nothing like I had imagined him to be at all. It's not how the book seemed to encourage me to think and inspire. It doesn't seem to follow his image. It's not like how I imagine he looked. He doesn't seem to act like the way I imagined he might. He doesn't have the same appearance, the same character, the same personality. Even his gestures are not like I imagined in my head. And somehow it takes the edge off everything. What about this verse that we've used more than once to encourage us in our prayer lives. In Ephesians 3 and verse 20, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. The scripture here, perhaps, is seeking to encourage us that however big the need, however crushing and immense the situation, God is far, far bigger than our greatest aspiration of him, than our greatest imagination of what he might do or be able to do is far more significant than all of that, but it encourages us in this whole scheme of imagining. Don't keep your thoughts small. Don't keep them cramped in. Don't keep them magnified, but magnify them and enlarge them. Ask big, imagine big, Bigger, biggest, wide, wider, larger, vaster. And he's still always bigger and larger and wider and vaster than even your imagination can take in. In fact, even all of our imaginations all put together. That's how he is. 
See, the bottom line is this. God gave us an imagination, so he's very happy for us to use it. In fact, he's probably pretty offended if we don't. It's like getting a gift and not unwrapping it and just throwing it to one side. He gave it there for us to use. He expects us to use it. Do you ever let your imagination run right and think, well, what does God actually look like? And how does he speak? What does it sound like, his voice? When he performs a miracle, when we read these miracles in the Bible, what might it have been like to actually be there and see it with my own eyes? If I'd seen it, what would it actually have looked like? And the whole thing comes alive. So every time we examine the scriptures, we have this fabulous opportunity to let our imagination run riot. And all it does is add flavor and color and life and energy to all the stuff that we read. You see, it's not just important to read it, but how we read it is important as well. See, when we view a film, the scenario, the characteristics, the action, it's all there, it's all set, it's all been settled long ago behind the camera, within the script, and it's already been dictated and styled by the actors that are acting it and everything. And it's interpreted to us by a series of other individuals. When we pin our ears back for an audio recording, we are subjected to the narrator's tone, his sense of drama and emotion to paint a picture for us. As we read, our minds and thoughts are left to form the images of the scenes before us within our own imagination. And that's all part of the great adventure of God speaking to us through his scriptures. What does Paul say in Philippians 4 and verse 8? Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And this, this is not an abstract thinking about that subject or this subject. This is a picturing in our minds with our imagination all of these kind of things that are positive and helpful to spiritual living. We're encouraged to engage our imagination, to think about, to picture in our thought lives those true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable things that he's talking about. And that's requiring more than a pondering in our thoughts, but are engaging and forming pictures in our minds and in our heads. And such things shape our mindset and our outlook. And we actually start getting excited about what's coming next. What is the next verse going to bring? What's God going to share as I continue to move all of this? And as we engage our imagination and read the scriptures, so our relationship with God and our knowledge of God continues to grow. So let's just do that again. Let's have a practical exercise this morning. And let's read strangely, exactly that same Bible passage that was read right at the beginning of the service this morning about Jesus' wonderful entrance on Palm Sunday. It's described in every one of the four Gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, but perhaps not strangely at all. I've chosen to share it with you from Matthew's Gospel like we did earlier. So it'll probably come up on the screen. Okay. You will see it perhaps in your Bible, in your own translation. Let me read it to you again. And as I read it, just let your imagination begin to flow and try and see the scene how you think you would see it in your imagination. Right? As they approached Jerusalem, came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he'll send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle, and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt 
and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Very large crowds spread their cloaks on the road, whilst others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Crowds that went ahead of them and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who's this? Crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So, in your mind's eye, what do you see? during this incident. For instance, what do you imagine Christ's mood to be in the middle of all of this? Do you see him perhaps as somber or smiling, waving or motionless? Is he riding high in the saddle or is he bowed before the adulation of the crowds? Is he laughing or is he excited? Is he Waving his arms with triumph, or is he just sitting there looking regal, majestic? What about the animals? Seems to imply that they were both ridden somehow. That just might be the language, but if so, did he ride them both at the same time or at different times? Were they side by side or one following the other? Did they trot in procession? Were those present in the crowd aware of the Old Testament prophecy that predicted in all of this? Were one or two thinking, ah, I read about this in the Old Testament. Are they knowingly having conversations or are they shouting all about it in the middle of the street as Jesus rides by? And what about the disciples who were sent to get the animals in the first place? What did they make of all those instructions of Jesus? Just go and pick these animals up, and if anyone queries what you're doing, just say the Lord needs them. Did they really imagine that, that was going to happen? Or was someone going to come charging after them for stealing their donkey? Were they in awe? Or just plain confused? Did they understand the significance of it all? What was the expression? If you see their face, what did their face look like? What's the expression? And what possessed them to throw their coats or cloaks onto the backs of the animals for Jesus to ride? What was that all about? And the scene in the street. How do you see that happening? All those cloaks, all those garments, were the animals actually trampling through them or were they spread eagled across the walls and fences and gates and trees and bushes? How was it? Or maybe they were waving them like scarves of football supporters. Who knows? Did the crowd actually get it at all? Did they really grasp what was going on or who Jesus was? How come some of them had to actually ask the question, who's this then? In the midst of all of this, how did that happen? Had they not heard of his reputation, his teachings, his deeds? And did the crowd's assertion, well, he's the prophet from Nazareth, did that really cut the mustard? Was that who he was, or was he far more than that? And so we vent our imagination, and then we discover what we see and hear, and it all adds to the great picture, God's message to you and me. And then afterwards, we peruse the context and the content of the whole passage and see perhaps how accurate or otherwise her concept might have been problem with imagination it isn't always real it always isn't to the point and sometimes it strays but there we have the context to steer us back to where we should be and the whole scripture comes alive as we allow the holy spirit to stir our imagination give it a try this week as you read your bible and lastly a magic word give it the priority it deserves give it the priority it deserves the reality is that we will read nothing more important each day than God's word. No newspaper, no novel, no textbook, no manual could ever be as vital as hearing and learning from God. And yet, strangely, our Bibles are often the last pages of print that we would consider consulting, especially if we're pushed for time. I can only imagine that if any of us were ever blessed enough to receive an envelope mailed from Buckingham Palace and bearing the Queen's royal crest, there it is, falls on the mat through the letterbox, catches your eye, what it looks like, 
something from Buckingham Palace amidst all the other mail. I know which one I'm going to open first. I know which one's going to catch my eye. I'll just let the bills wait for a bit longer. And I'll pick up the letter from Buckingham Palace and see what the Queen might have to say. Everything else will be secondary. And I will probably read it over and over and over and over and over again. In fact, I will probably never get rid of that letter, but I will probably keep it and show it to every person that walks inside my door. I will probably frame it and put it on the wall or something and make sure everybody knows about this letter that I have had from the Queen. It's important. It has priority. King of kings, Lord of lords, almighty God wishes to communicate with you and with me. He will often do that through the scriptures. What an opportunity missed if we don't actually open the cover and take a glance at the page during the day. We need to give our Bible readings the priority it deserved. Is there anything that I'll read today that's more important than those scriptures? Peter puts it this way in 1 Peter 2 and verse 2, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. And in this verse, the apostle paints a graphic picture of a newborn infant crying out for its mum's milk and compares that with a passionate yearning that's so vital for growing Christians to hunger after the scriptures, the need to feast upon God's word. The babe doesn't know very much at all. In fact, as it grows up, it won't remember those early moments at all in its memory banks. But it knows what it needs, and so whilst it can't communicate that yet in words, it cries, because that cry will convey to mom, I'm hungry, and I need something to eat. I need your milk. Do we have a similar passion for God's word? So far as the young child is concerned, the milk comes first. Nothing else is of any importance. He or she is hungry and everything else fades into insignificance. Bible reading is not just something else that we do. It's a priority. It's right up there for every Christian as one of those most essential things to engage in each day. It's not take it or leave it. It's not something else to fit in. It's not simply a duty or an obligation. It's far beyond some kind of heavenly expectation. It's that, but so much more. It's of paramount importance, something that we neglect or discard to our own peril. So don't be surprised if we grow weak and sickly, if we persistently reject to eat the food that's upon our physical plate. And the same goes for that spiritual sustenance that comes from God's word. Our spiritual life will suffer if we neglect the food for our soul and spirit. It's not about honoring or pampering our feelings, but it's about what's doing right and best for our spiritual health. See, whatever mom does and whatever her circumstances and however difficult her situation, she will always make it priority to ensure that there's food available for a baby. Everything else is of less significance. Do we think our Heavenly Father's love for you or me is any the less severe or persistent or energetic? He has made his available to us, his word universally, but also on a day-by-day basis. So what are the priorities in your daily list of things to do? Where does your Bible reading get placed? Does it need moving higher up the list perhaps are you getting a desire to read more of the scriptures I just love it this whole notion of putting time aside that God can speak to us opening the page what's going to happen today what is he going to say today well I've read that a dozen times before but I've never seen that before Lord how many times does that happen how well used is your Bible Get your imagination flying as you read. Make the scriptures a vital part of your diet. It's absolute priority. And let's see what a difference will be affected in your walk with God and my walk with God this week. How about it?